Greetings, and welcome to this episode of Quality of Life. In this episode, we're going to talk about skilled nursing centers and what services they can provide for somebody when it can become to their lifetime where they are looking for such services. Today joining us is Michael Free, who is administrator from Meadowview Manor Skilled Nursing Center. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Dave. Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, before we get started, could you give us a little bit of your background as far as how long have you been involved with the nursing center? Sure. I've been with uh, Meadowview Manor for just over a year, uh, but I've been in long-term care uh, with the same company, Extended Care, for just over eight years, working on my ninth. Uh, my background is I, I got my license as a social worker, and that's what I started my career off as. Um, about a year and a half ago, I got my license as a nursing home administrator, and that's where, I, where I'm at today. Okay. What type of services does a skilled nursing center provide? Well, I think a lot more than what most people would think. Uh, we offer a, a wide range of services, anywhere from a short-term uh, skilled setting uh, to more of a long-term uh, setting where we're going to help out with activities of daily living, uh, helping those who are uh, battling chronic conditions. Uh, so we, we assist with the dressing, the grooming, the bathing, uh, tasks that they might otherwise have difficulty doing at home or even with the support of their family. Uh, in the short term setting, what our goals are is to get people back home. So we have a number of services from uh, occupational therapy to speech therapy and physical therapy, which probably most people are familiar with. Um, and our goal there is to get a person back to their prior living uh, ability uh, so we can get them back home or back to an assisted living or wherever it is that they, they would like to live. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what should I do about, you know, if I want to choose a nursing center? Good question. I think there's a lot of things that you have to take into consideration. Uh, one, I, what I would recommend doing is, is hopping on the internet um, and, and going, doing, some, doing some research first. Uh, I would take a look at the, the CMS website, and that stands for the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Uh, and they do a, a real thorough evaluation of all the nursing homes in the United States. Um, it's based on a five-star ranking system uh, where they rate each nursing facility or skilled nursing facility um, up to five stars on their past survey history, um, their staffing ratios, for RN coverage and LPN coverage, your direct hands-on care, as well as for their Q metrics, uh, which, uh, which is, is a number of different components, uh, anywhere from uh, pressure sores or incontinence or um, uh, pain management, a number of things that we get measured on as a skilled nursing facility um, to, to manage and, and improve upon. Uh, so hop on that website, and you can find that website um, actually on, uh, it's www.medicare.gov, uh, and, and take a look there. I would, that's where I would start. Uh, once you've narrowed it down to uh, maybe three or four skilled nursing facilities, um, and, and I guess going back for a second, I would look at the facilities that are five stars, four stars, and maybe even the three star facilities. Um, and once you've, once you've narrowed them down, uh, location obviously might be important because uh, you'll want to be able to visit your loved one and not have to drive you know, miles to, to do that. Um, so that might help narrow it down again to maybe two or three. Now I suggest stop in that nursing center, take a look at it, um, and maybe not even give them a call, but just drop in uh, so they're not expecting it. Uh, I, sometimes I wonder if, if skilled facilities, if they're expecting it, you know, they're going to try to pretty it up a little bit for mm -hmm. you. Um, just, just drop in, uh, see, see what it's like when they're not expecting you. Uh, see what the meals are like, maybe have a meal there. Uh, I, I know most skilled facilities will, will invite you and they'll have a meal. Uh, that way you get a, a taste of what the food is like. Uh, see what the activities are like, uh, make sure that they have a calendar with, with a number of events going on uh, throughout the day, even on the weekends, so that the, the residents of that facility have things to do. Uh, I think that's real important for their psychosocial well-being. I think it's important for socialization. It's important for a number of reasons. So you want to make sure that, that the meals are there, that the activities are there, and then you want to see how the staff is interacting with the, with the residents and with each other. Uh, you know, are they, they calling them dear or sweetie or honey? Mm -hmm. Do they really know their name? Uh, I think that's very important. Um, and you got to kind of, you got you to weigh your options. Sometimes 
people go in and they, they find these big, beautiful centers. Uh, and there might be a lot of residents in those centers where they might feel a little overwhelmed. Uh, for some, they might, they might really enjoy that. For others, they might be looking for a smaller setting, uh, kind of that little mom and pop shop. Sure. Uh, so it, it's, it's weighing some options, seeing what you feel comfortable in. Uh, once you've done that, uh, you know, have a chance to sit down with, your, with the administrator, with the, the business office manager, um, and get some information about the place, a little, a little background. I, I think that would probably be the most important places to start. Okay. Do they offer references as well? Say if I came to your facility and say, could you give me some references as well for people to check? Is that usually done? When you, references. Let's say if I want, if I have one of my family members who wants to go to a nursing home and I'm doing my research, and I'd say if I would approach Meadowview Manor, mm -hmm. could I ask, you know, is there any references like other people who have stayed there or whatever other families, is that usually done or not? Yeah, what we try to do is get testimonials throughout okay. a person's stay, uh, both long-term and short-term, so you get a good idea of what uh, some of our long-term residents are going through, uh, as well as our short-term residents, you know, the things they mm -hmm. liked, I mean, if they had some frustrations, uh, that way you get a whole whole picture of uh, mm -hmm. their stay at, at one of the particular facilities. So most places are going to have something similar to that. Okay. You had mentioned CMS and their website. Now I yeah. know in healthcare, which is definitely what a skilled nursing center is part of. I used to work in a hospital. Okay. And we always had routine um, surveys like Joint Commission would come in, which they would do it for all the CMS and your benchmark measurements that you had to submit. Are those similar surveys that happen? on a routine basis in a skilled nursing center as well? Yeah, actually every nine to 16 months um, after, excuse me, nine to 15 months after uh, their, the, the facility's last survey, uh, they go into what's called a window, uh, where they, at any time during that window, they can expect another annual survey. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a team from either the Madison, Green Bay, or Milwaukee area will come in, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for, for a few days, three, four days, and they will do a, a, a complete uh, audit of your facility. They'll look at the cleanliness, they'll look at uh, some of those key metrics I was talking sure. about. They'll look for infection control policies, procedures, how they're rolled out and deployed throughout the facility, uh, and the competency of the staff. So they, they do that uh, roughly every 12 months. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I've chosen the nursing center, picked one, I want to move in. What's the average length of stay you know, for somebody who's going to be there? That too is a good question. I would say that's a real hard question to answer. Sure. And, and it depends on what you're, you're coming in for. Uh, we do see a lot of people coming in after uh, a hip or a knee surgery. Uh, so like post ortho. And it's gonna depend on your physical ability. Um, you know, how active you were prior, uh, maybe um, some of your, your current um, ailments, mm -hmm. and how you respond to the therapy. Uh, I would say for a patient that's coming in with a hip or a knee, it could be anywhere from a, a few days to a you know, few weeks. Uh, I think it's a pretty common length of stay. Uh, some other patients are coming in, say, with a, a CBA or a stroke. Uh, they might want to utilize a little bit more of their benefit, their Medicare benefit, their managed sure. care benefit, uh, and stay a little longer. Uh, one interesting statistic that I could give you uh, with stroke is that 90% of your rehab comes within the first 90 days. And the remaining 10% of what you're going to get back after a stroke comes within the next two years. Yep. So if Medicare is offering up to 100 days of, of skilled service, uh, I think it's real important for those, those folks to try to capture as much rehab as they can uh, before they no longer meet the criteria for mm -hmm. skilled care under the Medicare guidelines, mm -hmm. uh, which there's a, a, a nice complementary of staff there that, that help determine what your benefits are and keep you uh, aware of that as you, as you continue on with your, your therapy process. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point you bring up on what your range of benefits are, because I know my, when my wife had her stroke, it was you know, the insurance only paid for X amount of days in rehab and then that was it. So like you had said, take advantage of what you can. Yeah. And then hopefully with the work that was done in the rehab, it'll bring the rest. And like you said, that can last up to two years with the yeah. exercises they give, you know, um, yeah. along with that, is a skilled nursing center used for, let's say, an end of life sequence, say if you have a terminal disease and is that something that a skilled nursing center would also facilitate or is that more of a hospice type function? 
Well, actually, our, our skilled nursing facilities today, more so than ever, I think, are working with the hospice agencies, okay. uh, trying to partner up because these, these skilled nursing facilities uh, can, can supply that 24-7 care. Uh, in hospice, what they're doing is they're, they're coming in and adding to an already great service by, by bringing in a team of nurses and social workers okay. and chaplains. Uh, so it, it's, it, it makes that experience for the family, for that patient, um, as easy as that process possibly can be for that person. Um, it is a, a very difficult time, uh, but having hospice, uh, having that partnership with hospice certainly uh, certainly makes that process much, much more easy. Okay. So I know I realize I have to, I want to look for a skilled nursing center. Uh, we already talked about some of the um, things I should do in choosing one. Is there any other type of research that I could do or anything else I should look at before really approaching the facility or requesting a tour? Yeah, I, I would say. Uh, <clears throat> I forgot to touch on this earlier, yeah. but uh, there, there, there are awards that, that skilled nursing facilities can achieve. Uh, one of them is the AHCA NCAL uh, award. Uh, it's a real prestigious award. It's based on uh, the Bald Ridge Performance Excellence Program, uh, which, which holds a very high standard of quality care uh, that a facility needs to meet to achieve this award. Mm -hmm. Um, currently, Meadowview Manor had just received the Silver Award. Uh, this award goes in three steps. You first apply uh, for the bronze, and then the silver, and then eventually the gold. Um, in applying for these, you have to write a paper uh, explaining your, your, your quality uh, assurance programs, uh, what you do when you see uh, an area of deficiency, and how you correct that, and then how you deploy that throughout your staff. Uh, which is, I think, so incredibly important. Because it's one thing for your, your senior leaders to really understand how to uh, facilitate or take care mm -hmm. of an organization and its residents. But if your frontline staff, who I think are probably your most important employees, the ones taking care of mom and dad, Definitely. if they don't know how to do it, it does, it does no good. Mm -hmm. So understanding how you deploy those practices down to the, the line staff, the front staff, um, is what these awards are all about. Mm -hmm. And like I said, for 2014, Meadowview Manor was able to uh, capture that, that silver award uh, through our deployment processes. So excellent question. Yeah. And, and with any organization, really, you build quality into your processes. And it just doesn't start at the top with somebody with an idea. It's got to be top to bottom, side to side, you know, mm -hmm. in and out everywhere. And that's what makes a true you know, high performance quality organization. And that's in any industry, really. Exactly. So, excellent. No, I mean, it's, it's one thing for, for your staff in dietary to understand, uh, you know, residents' preferences if they like the, mm -hmm. the grilled cheese or the hot dog. Yep. But it's equally as important for them to know, uh, you know, what, what foods are important for uh, skin integrity, weight management, uh, a, a whole number of different things. You talked a little bit about hospice mm -hmm. earlier. Um, and the different types of foods that we're going to serve to somebody on hospice opposed mm -hmm. to someone who is looking at uh, maybe trying to lose weight yep. or um, has, has different goals in mind. Mm -hmm. So having everybody in the facility from housekeeping to dietary to nursing and maintenance all be on that same page, always looking for improving quality, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely important. I know in the Joint Commission training that I went through, one of the things is first impressions is always the key to everything mm -hmm. in the training we took. And you know, that's why going on a tour, you know, doing your research first, then going on the tour, you know, that's what they says, you know, it's quality got to be all the time. It's not just here or there. It's got to be 24 by 7, top yes. to bottom everywhere, because, you know, it could be the squeaky wheelchair mm -hmm. or, you know, some little tile out of place in the ceiling. And that leaves, you know, a lasting first impression, which can be a, you know, effect whether they decide to come to a facility or not. Yeah. So... So if I choose and I get accepted and I'm on my way, what are the methods that I can use to you know, pay for the service? You know? Well, there's, there's a wide range of benefits that are available to people. Um, I think the, the big one that most people are probably going to be familiar with is their Medicare benefit, Medicare Part A and B and, and D. Uh, D is your drug plan, B is where your, your therapies are going to be paid from, and then Medicare Part A is what your room and board and your medications are gonna be paid from, excuse mm -hmm. me, the medications through D, but your room and board. 
Um, there's also going to be managed care programs now. Uh, those are those are the, the Medicare replacement policies, I think, which are becoming more and more popular. Um, I wouldn't want to give any kind of recommendations on what is better or, sure. or, or what's going to suit that person. Uh, but certainly, you know, going down to the ADRC and speaking with somebody there, they can help, they can help guide you there, uh, which I think is real important because those policies are so confusing. Uh, but we also have a very young um, population coming into us too, uh, needing a hip or a knee surgery. Right. And they're bringing their commercial insurances in with them uh, from where they work, which, you know, we will, we will run those benefits just like we would with the managed care or the, the Medicare. Um, private pay is also an option. Um, most people are hoping that they have some other form of insurance, but sure. private pay is certainly an option. And for the bulk of our patients that are by us or in any skilled nursing facility for that matter, I think Medicaid is probably going to be the most relevant. And Medicaid is a program that is uh, set up through the state of Wisconsin uh, to help those seniors be able to afford health care. Um, and for that, again, going down to the ADRC and getting in touch with someone to apply for uh, medical assistance would be, you know, important there. And that's where you, we're having a business office manager um, at a skilled nursing facility is so important because she will help or he will help you through that process. There's, there's so much paperwork and mm -hmm. um, it becomes very confusing as to all the information you need. And to have that, that person that does that day in and day out help guide you and lead you through that, it, it makes that process very easy and seamless and not that you miss anything along the way. That's interesting, paperwork. It seems like everywhere you go, there's paperwork. You know, in a society that's supposedly electronic with smart devices, you know, it seems like we have just as much paper as before. It's unbelievable. You yeah. You fill the stuff out. <laughs> so that's just a side note to me, and that's my IT hat on, so to speak, you know, yeah, as yeah. far as that goes. No, I know a lot of facilities are, like you said, they're going paperless mm -hmm. with uh, the EMR processes, yep. trying to get everything on, sure. on record. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely does not eliminate all the paperwork. Okay. Are there any certain dietary restrictions or that you, you address through your care or your plans or let's say allergies or certain, you know, other type of circumstances that, you know, a patient may be coming into you to see? What do you do for that or how do you handle that? Well, that, that too, it's, it's a, a process that's completed by our interdisciplinary team, uh, which involves our nursing staff, our dietitian, who plays a very integral role in that part, uh, that, that person's uh, primary physician. Um, and, and the team as a whole. So mm -hmm. what we want to do is we want to, A, look at what their goals are, um, and then B, uh, provide them with what is the safest, uh, most appealing uh, diet to them. Uh, so we do offer the different types of uh, consistencies if that is needed, uh, whether that's mechanical or pureed diets, uh, grinding the, the meats, the foods up a little sure. bit finer, easier to swallow. Uh, we also offer the different uh, consistencies of liquid, uh, so we can do just the, the thin liquids or the, the honey or the nectar, uh, the, the liquids that help prevent any type of aspiration if there are swallowing issues, mm -hmm. uh, which we also have a speech therapist there that works hand in hand with that to help a person try to get to the, uh, the most whole uh, solid foods again and thin liquids um, that you know, most people are gonna wanna prefer. Uh, but we do offer the, the no added salts, the controlled carb diets, um, a wide variety of different diets. Um, but again, it's, it's driven by the patient and the dietitian at the facility and their doctor. Um, so we have care planning meetings um, upon admission mm -hmm. and then at least every 90 days after or more if they ask um, or we feel it would be necessary. Uh, to sit down and talk about those things. Talk about, you know, what are your goals? Have they changed? You know, are you happy with your mm -hmm. diet? Um, upon admission, we also take down people's food preferences uh, so we can kind of customize a meal to them. Uh, so, uh, so, we're, so we're serving things that people want. Um, so if I want steak and lobster, I can get that? Absolutely. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> we would work with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Now you got me hungry, you'll have to go out later. There you go. Uh, but, but we do do that. We, we, okay. we come up with you know, your, your preferences. And then we also have um, an alternative menu. So once you get to lunch, if, if you see on the, the, the first option and the second option, that it's just not, not what you want that day. We have this alternative menu. 
and I think a number of facilities may have this, and it's something worth looking at when you go in for your tours. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but an alternative menu. So can you get, at any time of the day, could you get you know, different soups or sandwiches or salads or, or eggs or, or fruit, vegetables, mm -hmm. different things that, um, you know, if you're not interested, like me, who's a very picky eater, might not be interested in what's being served that day. So I can still call Domino's or Chinese? Absolutely. Nice. And, and we do have that. And, and you should. Uh, I think when people come to a skilled nursing facility, they're coming there to live. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that sometimes uh, there's a misconception that, that that's not why you're coming there. Right. But you're coming there to live. And you should treat that as your house. You should, you should want to do the things that, that you've always done. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, if, if ordering that Domino's pizza is going to make you happy on, on Friday night, pop in a movie and watch, eat Domino's? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, let your nurse know, let your doctor know, mm -hmm. this is what, what my preferences are, this is what my goals in life are, this is how I want to care plan the rest of my life. And, and live it. Live your life to the fullest. And they'll let you know what the consequences sure. of that are. They'll educate you on that, mm -hmm. and you can weigh those options. Uh, but I, I think there, there has to be a balance of, of health and quality, um, which I think is, is so incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, then definitely tied to the associated care plan that's been developed as well. Absolutely. As far as that goes. Absolutely. With, with that, you know, the, the um, continuation of care. So if I transfer, let's say, from the hospital to a skilled nursing center for the reasons, and then do I still get to see my own physician, or is there a new set of staff and physicians, or how often can I still see my physician? Well, good question. You got a, you got a number of options there, too. Uh, every facility is going to have a medical director that oversees that entire facility. Uh, if, you come in, if you're coming in from out of, out of state or mm -hmm. uh, out of the area, uh, maybe family's here and you live in Tennessee, um, so you're coming here to be close to family, we have our medical director that will take on your care. Um, so maybe upon entering into a facility on a tour, that's another good question to ask. You know, who is your medical director? You know, where, where are some of your policies uh, coming from? Because uh, he helps play a role in that. Sure. Uh, if you're coming in locally, you're here in Sheboygan, uh, most doctors are going to round at all the facilities. Uh, some maybe have a select few that they go to because it's, it's very time consuming to see maybe every facility in town. Uh, but, but a large number of physicians are going to tour at each center. So keeping your own physician is, is there's a very, very real chance that that could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what happens is while you're at the hospital, you're in pretty critical care. Um, and that doctor needs to be there, and that's why you are in the hospital, so that doctor can see you uh, every day or multiple times a day, mm -hmm. see how things are going. After a couple of days or a few days, uh, or even a week if it was uh, severe enough, oh, uh, they're going to discharge you to a lesser skilled setting, uh, like a skilled nursing facility, where, where it's still very acute, uh, but not to the same degree as a hospital. Uh, and that doctor then is saying at that point, you are, you are stable enough to be seen less often, and through the through the, the the vision of the nurses, maybe nurse practitioners that round at that center, uh, who are very trained, very skilled um, individuals, and that report back to that doctor uh, during during your stay at the skilled nursing facility. That doctor will come see you though at least once within the first 30 days, and then the next two months after that by state law. Uh, then after that, it's every other month with a nurse practitioner subbing in. Um, and again, it's, it's a lot of communication from the patient to the nursing staff, the CNAs to the nursing staff, mm -hmm. and updating the doctor and keeping him aware of what's going on um, with any positive changes or, or even the negative changes. So the doctor can then um, decide to change the plan of care, uh, maybe come in for a visit, or have that patient be seen at the hospital again. Like with anything else, it comes down to communication, you know, the transfer of the patient or that handoff, so to speak. Absolutely. You know, is what we were trained on. And, so. and there's a number of tools that I think a lot of facilities are going to have in place for that, whether it's the, the SBAR communication tool, mm -hmm. the Interact uh, communication tool. There's a number of tools that, that skilled nursing facilities are, are using in adjunction with uh, the hospitals uh, to improve that communication. You, you talked a little bit about mm -hmm. the, the warm handoffs. Um, so there's some real positive uh, changes or, or th things that are being implemented uh, in today's healthcare that makes that transition, that communication so much stronger and better, um, even some of that electronical records sure. <laughs> that we have now.
What are type of, what are some of the types of therapy services that a facility would provide? Uh, most facilities you're going to see the, they're, they're going to have a physical therapy department, um, occupational therapy and speech therapy. Those are your three common ones. Uh, physical therapy, I think most people are, are pretty familiar with. It's a lot of strength, endurance, balance, um, kind of the getting stronger sure. um, therapy. Your OT is going to be more of your fine motor skills, your activities of daily living. So uh, kind of getting ready to get back into the, the community, get back mm -hmm. into your house. So you might do some cooking, some cleaning, some dressing, um, bathing, toileting, things like that. So, you, so you're taking all the strengths and abilities that you're getting from PT and now you're applying it. Uh, speech therapy, what speech therapy can do, and most people think, you know, I, I can talk just fine. I've been doing it for X amount of years. I don't need speech. But they also work on cognition and swallowing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's, it's big. So they will work on speech if a person needs that. Say, so again, going back to the stroke, if, if you need uh, help getting words out, memory finding, things like that, which also ties so closely with, with cognition. Mm -hmm. um, but they will help with, with uh, word finding, problem solving, um, again, getting you back to your prior uh, level of function so you can live the life that you were living before your ailment. Um, so, so they do offer the three. Um, one thing to look into, though, is how often are they offering the three? Are they offering it five days a week or seven days a week? Uh, I think it's an important question. Uh, you, you, you never want to come in on a Friday night and end up sitting Saturday, Sunday, um, feeling like you're wasting time. Mm -hmm. So see if a facility can provide it seven days a week. Can I, can I be seen on Saturday, Sunday? Most physicians are going to order for five days a week, or most insurance companies are going to cover for five days a week. But if you can get started right away, that's a good feeling, even if then you take off a Wednesday and a Thursday sure. later on that week. Sure. Um, what are some of the activities that you know, are available for people? I think you're going to see in a lot of skilled nursing facilities that they're going to really focus on trying to provide activities for, for a wide variety of skill levels, uh, from the person who needs the wheelchair to, uh, for mobility mm -hmm. to the person who might be ambulating independently without a walker. Uh, so you're going to want to come up with different tasks that um, maybe not everybody can do every task, mm -hmm. but that everybody can do something, uh, which is so important because the, the focus in the activities, which um, in, in my center we call it uh, our life enrichment program, because what we're trying to do is enhance the quality of their life. We're trying to look at their, like I said before, their psychosocial, their social, their spiritual needs um, through activities that are, are going to be, um, you know, whether it's physical or emotional, uh, just a, a wide variety of activities to, to keep that person um, as content and happy as possible. Okay. Um, we're about to wrap, so do you have any other final thoughts, Michael? Uh, no, if you, uh, if you ever have a question, you know, feel free to stop in for a tour. Uh, myself or another person, I'm sure I'd be happy, of any, as well as any other facility, come in for a tour. Like I said before, probably the most important thing when looking for a skilled nursing facility. Okay. Well, that concludes this episode of Quality of Life on Skilled Nursing Centers. On behalf of the show, I'd like to thank Michael for joining us for Metaview Manor Skilled Nursing Center. Um, if anybody has any questions or would like more information, you can contact us on our website at www.wscssheboygan.com. I'm your host, Dave Augustine, and thank you for watching. Thank you.